So I wanted to start off, the rabbi will be joining uh, momentarily. The rabbi will be joining momentarily. But meanwhile, um, I just want to say a few words of introduction. First of all, it's a pleasure to see everyone here tonight. Welcome. Thank you for coming, for being with us. And, you know, I was thinking we are meeting with Jewish communities around the world, mostly in places where the population is very, is, is much smaller than definitely what we have in Montreal, where we're anywhere between 80 to 100,000. Most communities we've been talking to have from 500 to several thousand, 5,000 or so uh, Jews, sometimes scattered around in a big area. And what's been fascinating until now, and the feedback I've heard from many of you and, and myself in the experience, <laughs> is that no matter how big or small, and no matter how remote, and whether there was history there for many years, like last uh, week when we were with Greece, where there's thousands of years of history, or we went to some places at the Dubai where the history is almost just a few years, you can count on your, both your hands. But yet, when the Jewish community, when there's leadership who, who's involved in the community trying to bring people together, what happens is that there becomes a vibrant uh, life, Jewish life, and people who are becoming closer to their Jewish heritage, who are getting more involved, who are doing more Jewish things, who are building stronger Jewish institutions. And this, I think, is very much connected to the Torah portion of this week. Because this week we read about, in the portion of Teruma, about God's command to build a, a sanctuary, to build a temple for him, in the desert, but it wasn't just for the desert. This was the command to build the temple, which later became the beautiful temple in Jerusalem, which today we just are able to go to the wall, to the kota, the western wall, which holds up as the retaining wall for the plaza that held up the incredible temple, which was the house of God. And, and we know that the, the te second temple was destroyed close to 2,000 years ago. We don't, haven't had a physical temple for so many years. Where has it been taken uh, to? Why has it been taken away from us? And the truth is that the command to make a temple was not just that physical building. That building was a symbol to us of how we can take any place in the world, any building, any area, any piece of land, any country, any, any place where there is some kind of civilization, and by sanctifying it for God and by doing things uh, as Jews, we're having in mind what God wants us to do, to be strong as a people and to hold close to our heritage and our, our pride of being a Jew. That's how we build modern day temples. It's not necessarily a building. It could be the synagogue is a miniature temple. It's as well our home. But more than that, the environment, the cities, the towns, the countries we're in by creating a Jewish presence. So, you know, I think our journey is really a big part of it is seeing this command, but more than command, this ability that God gave us is that wherever we are, we're able to build a, a sanctuary, a, a place, a people, a group, that are dedicated to God and are growing in the acts of goodness and kindness and Jewish continuity and Jewish strength. So this is, this is uh, something that's very heartwarming when we see these temples uh, all over, these um, cities, towns, countries, which have been either re rededicated or continue to be dedicated or newly dedicated to be an abode, the dwelling place for God in this world. And what's interesting is, this week someone, I'm not sure if they're on here, sent me a picture, they traveled to India a number of years ago. They traveled to India a number of years ago, 
and they uh, they saw, I think in Dar es Salaam, they saw a, a a beautiful Chabad house, and they asked me, "Do I recognize the Chabad house?" And I said, "You should know that that Chabad house is a replica. The building is a replica of the Chabad headquarters in New York, the 770 Eastern Parkway, where besides having Chabad houses in over a hundred countries around the world." There is um, several that were built to replicate exactly the Lubavitch World Headquarters uh, in Crown Heights, for those who have seen it or have seen the picture. But these are the, well, the buildings that are happening uh, everywhere, wherever we go. While we're talking, we, um, we have joined, you have to unmute yourself, Rabbi. We have joined with us our guests, our uh, guest, and I want to welcome, take this moment to welcome um, our guest for tonight, uh, a, a fellow, uh, a colleague, a fellow shliach, uh, emissary of the Rebbe, leader of the Jewish community um, in Alaska, Rabbi uh, Yossi Greenberg, who together with his wife, Esti, lead uh, Chabad and the Jewish community in Alaska for Tell us exactly, I believe, close to 30 years. Um, just to say a word, you know, when I was uh, a, a bacher in yeshiva, I'm a few years younger. I remember uh, he was one of the leading yeshiva students, very much, uh, very much uh, respected and uh, got accomplished a lot as, uh, as a, someone in yeshiva, though he had come from Israel. He went to one of the furthest places in America to, to with his wife together to uh, strengthen Jewish life. And uh, we're here tonight to learn about what Jewish life is in Alaska uh, today, what it was, what it is today, and, and, and how it's continuing uh, to build. So, Rabbi Greenberg, before I, I ask you to uh, please introduce yourself and give us a little background on how you ended up in Alaska, I must say that tonight there's a lot of interest was in Montreal, we usually think that we're the coldest uh, city in this part of the world. So everyone was excited to hear if Alaska is maybe a little colder. So, so I was telling people, I don't know in the temperature outside, but what I hear about the years and the, from reports that people have been there and all the things I read is that you've definitely made it very warm on the inside. But today we're, we're, here, to, we're here to hear the whole story. So uh, please, Rabbi Greenberg, welcome. It's an honor for me, Rabbi Krasiansky, to, I have known Rabbi Krasiansky for many years as in yeshiva and uh, old, and I know his family. I don't even know if he knows that we are somehow relatives. Yes. Fourth or fifth generation, we are relatives. And um, and uh, it's a pleasure actually speak about Montreal. Um, my son got married to a, to a wonderful young a Chabad lady from Montreal just two years ago, and I went to the wedding. And, um, and I couldn't believe them. And actually, the wedding was in the summer, but I came to Montreal a few years ago, if you remember, I was speaking there in the yeshiva there. Yes. In the Chabad community there. And, uh, and it was the middle of the winter, it was for Hay Tavis. And it was just, it looked exactly like Anchorage. It was packed with snow, it was cold, it was just, it was, I felt really home. So Anchorage, Anchorage does make it look like as if Alaska, but one of the times, probably Rabbi Kosansky knows. And we, we, when we went to Alaska in 1991, and we came by the Rebbe with a, a delegation of, sev of several families from Anchorage. So the Rebbe told, told them that Alaska gives a cold attention. The people when think about Alaska, they think of coldness. But the Rebbe said, but to live in Alaska, you need stronger temperature in the homes. So when it comes to spreading Yiddishkeit, you should not think of coldness in Alaska. You should think the opposite of warmth and excitement and to spend as, mo as much Yiddishkeit as you can. So. So for Montreal and Alaska, really, we are, we are just the same. Anchorage is sometimes cold, sometimes not so cold. Actually, today, I think that there is many cities in, in, in the lower 48 United States are colder today than in Anchorage. So, yeah, but that's not what the issues are about, right, Rabbi Krasiansky? That's right, that's right. When it's inside, we are warm in the heart and in the homes. That's the most important thing. So what are we talking today about? First of all, about, uh, as Rabbi Kasansky said, we're going to get ready for Purim. And what is what do we say in the Megillah? We say there is one nation, and even though that nation is spread around the world, 
among the nations, but we are, we are one nation. So those not even in Montreal and Anchorage, wherever you are, it's all the same. And we are all doing the same work with the same excitement. So yeah, so what do we, uh, I want to share with you first the history, how I came to Alaska. That's what you asked me, how I ended yes. up. Yes, I how did you end up? Because, yeah, because I, um, in 1983, 1984, um, I came, to, I, I was born in Russia. And as a little child, we immigrated to Israel in 1967. And when I was 17 year old boy, I was a teenager, I went to New York and I never looked back because I wanted to come and see the Rebbe and stand there, study under him. And that's what I did. So for the next 10 years, I studied under the Rebbe. However, by the Rebbe, there's no free lunches, as you know. So in, 1980, in 1983, a year after I was in New York, I was already sent to, I was 18 years old, I was sent to a yeshiva, a special yeshiva in Seattle, which was right near the University of, of Washington in Seattle. And we were providing classes and uh, Jewish services for the students in the, at the university. And the, the, the Chabad of Seattle is kind of the closest neighbor, you know, three and a half hours flying, as, even though that really Canada is closer to us. And there are two communities, I'm sorry, uh, the, I want to pay respect to Canada. Alberta and uh, Edmonton are actually closer to us, and we could we could drive there if we want to spend forty-eight hours on the road nonstop. And I had actually boys who went to a camp in in, in Edmonton, and they came here by after they drove for like forty-eight hours. They came here for for bringing for a city gathering. So we had that, but but because of the border and all those business realities, that Seattle is considered our. Uh, our, you know, our, our closest community and therefore, so to us to go to Seattle is nothing. The rabbi in Seattle, the shaliach in Seattle, when he was sent, Rabbi Levitin, when he was sent in 1972 to Seattle, he got from the rabbi's personal secretary, Rabbi Chodokov, he got, he got his, on his, um, as they say in his ktuba, he got six states uh, under him, the Washington and Alaska, and I think uh, it was um, Oregon. Oregon and uh, Vancouver, I mean, uh, British Columbia and, um, and, and, and all those, what is, the, what, is, what, is the, what is the neighborhood where you have Alberta and all of them? What is it called? Edmonton, Al Alberta, there's uh, Manitoba. The region that, what? Manitoba maybe, Alberta, British so Columbia. And he actually- Western Canada. Yes, and he actually flew to Alaska and he established a relation with the Jewish community here every year. And there were Shiva students who came here every year, the summer and the holidays and so on. So when I came to Seattle in 1983, we, the boys, would go to Alaska for the Jewish holidays from the Shiva in Seattle. And then I went back to New York in 19, at the end, we were two years in Seattle, 83 and 84. And 85, I went back to New York and I did my business. And as Rabbi Kraskosiansky told you to be under the Rebbe, there was nothing to study under the Rebbe. There was nothing like that in the world. Nothing was and nothing will be till Mashiach's coming. So, so anyway, as, as Rabbi Shlomo Kalabach, those of you heard when he gave the eulogy uh, after the Rebbe's passing in 1994, so he gave an amazing eulogy because he was very close to the Rebbe in the 1950s and he ended up with those words. I could tell you one thing, such a Rebbe was never before and never will be. And Tim she is coming. So, so anyway, so in 1990, in 1989, I got married to my wife in Detroit. And then we started to look for a shlichus because we, like Rabbi Kosiansky, we were raised by the Rebbe that there is nothing more noble in the world. In this generation after the Holocaust, there's nothing more important. To be a lawyer is important, to be a doctor is important, but there's nothing more noble than to re-establish and bring back the infrastructure that the Nazis destroyed because not only did we lose 6 million Jews physically, but even more or to, or as equal, all those millions of Jews who were kicked out from their homes, from their communities, from their rabbis, from their shivas, from their schools, from their families, and they, were, they ran for their life anywhere in America and Australia, and they came to cities with no Jewish infrastructure and they had nothing there. And therefore the Rebbe felt that our mission is the most important thing is to go and make sure if there is a place where there is no Yiddishkeit there, 
There should not be a Jewish kid in the world who will say, I never saw Torah, I never saw a rabbi, I never saw a synagogue, and, and I never learned Aleph Beit. And therefore we are there, the Rebbe raised us, the Rebbe didn't tell us to go anywhere. Here's Rabbi Rebbe Kisiansky, the Rebbe just told us, this is the most important thing to do, and we just did it. And so me and my wife were looking for a place to go, and of course we had offers the day of my wedding, and the next morning of my wedding I got calls in my hotel room, from a rabbi in Caracas, he wants me to come to Caracas, a rabbi in Texas. But we said, no, we want to go to a place where there's nothing there, where really is needed to reestablish everything from zero. And Rabbi Levitin, who was the Chabad rabbi in Seattle, who knew me from the yeshiva in Seattle in 1983-84, he came knocking on my door one day in Crown Heights. He said, the Jewish community in Alaska is now asking finally for a permanent Chabad rabbi, because there were rabbis who would come here for 20 years, from 1970 to 1991. And now they're finally asking for a permanent rabbi. And he came to us and we said, yeah, Alaska sounds right. We will go there for a visit. So in the summer of 1990, we went here for a visit and we fell in love with Alaska, went hiking with the community. And we are, our baby, our oldest son was a baby, was one years old. Actually, now he's a rabbi here, an hour away from us in the Metsu Valley. He has a beautiful Jewish center there. So we we went back to the we went back to New York. We wrote into the Rebbe a letter of three of three lines. We wrote to the Rebbe. The Rebbe Levitin is offering us the idea to go to Alaska for to be Chabad Rabbi and start a Chabad Az. And if what is the if the Rebbe gives his blessing, and the Rebbe just underlined the words, "I'm giving my blessing." That's it. And we decided to go. And then we went by the Rebbe and Rabbi Grona, the Rebbe secretary, told the Rebbe that we are going to open a new Chabad house. So the Rebbe actually, the first thing he did is that my baby was one years old. He said, he asked, is he also going to Alaska? And 20 years later, 25 years later, he actually opened up another center in Alaska. But he was a, I mean, he was a couple going. Obviously the baby was going with us, but the baby is going to stay in New York alone. But the Rebbe is asking, is he also going to Alaska? And, and he ended up to open a Chabad center here 25 years later. But anyway, so then the Rebbe turned to me and if any one of you have ever had the, uh, the, the merit to see the Rebbe or you saw videos of the Rebbe, the Rebbe's face lit up and he had a, such a smile like the sun is shining. And he looked at me, he smiled, and then he gave me a dollar and he said, you should, you should have great success there. And then, be, believe it or not, when I came to Alaska, I didn't expect much the, more than, you know, we, the, the community here, they got us a beautiful home and the downstairs of the synagogue, the upstairs of the house, and we felt, Great, because, you know, we knew it's a small community. We didn't expect anything more than that. But when the Rebbe said, Hatzlacha Rabba Muflaga, or be a great and amazing success, it is a lot there. I, I still, being by the Rebbe for 10 years, I still didn't know what, what every word really carries. And then, maybe 15 or 15 years later, opportunity has arrived, and we have a, Yiddish, a beautiful, huge campus with a museum and everything at the preschool, which we never expected that to happen. But you see, when you do the right thing, the Almighty God is with you, with the Rebbe's blessings. So that's just the story how I came to Alaska. So Rabbi Kaczynski, go for it. So, uh, yeah, that, which is definitely incredible. We want to obviously hear more and how it developed to the point where we even made something which most places don't have. You made the, the Alaska Jewish Museum. But, but tell us before, what was Jewish before? I remember when we opened up our Chabados, one of the first Shabbatons we had, was it Rabbi Haber, who at one time was a chaplain in the army in Alaska, and he was even involved in a mikveh there uh, in some projects. So, so, so what was there before? When did the Jewish community start in Alaska? Sure. How did Jews end up there? I know it's close to Russia as well, so I don't know where. I, how did it start and what, what it was like? That's a good question. The early Jews came to Alaska from Russia. The really early, early Jews, before they even... Alaska was purchased by, by America. But the big secret that our museum is going to reveal that the, world, the rest of the world knows that William III is the one who was the, the shatchan, the matchmaker who made it happen that Alaska should be purchased to, to, by America. But the, the real story, as, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story is that the Jewish people Jewish fur, tra fur traders from San Francisco were the ones who came up with the idea, invented the idea, and actually were pushing that, were pushing their senator call from, from San Francisco to push the idea to push William Seward, who was his classmate, 
that to actually go ahead and purchase Alaska. And the reason for it was because that 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 Tsar needed cash. He was out of cash, and he told himself, "What is Alaska? A box of ice? We'll sell it away." So they negotiated for six million dollars. And at the time, I mean, it was a it was a, a lot of years ago, 150 years ago. But at the time, um, there was a huge um, criticism in America. Why wasting money, six million dollars on a box of ice? And even they call it Stuart, 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 Stuart's folly, which means it was a was a foolish thing to do. Well, those Jewish fur traders from San Francisco received the, 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 the exclusive license to make business in Alaska. Now, and they became actually de facto the governors of Alaska for the first 20 years. And this was full. The trade was that they will, they will start the centers and they will bring some civilization here. Now, in, one, in the first year of business, the first year they brought into the treasury more than $6 million that Alaska was purchased for, that they gave to Russia. In one year of business, forget about the oil and everything. This is before the oil, before anything. So when, when President Putin came to America the first time, they asked him, is there anything he regrets, that Russia regrets? He said, yes, we sold Alaska. <laughs> so then when he came the second time, they said to him, what do you think about Alaska? He said, oh, we never sold it. It was all a lease. We won't have it back. So now they call Alaska and Russia in the parliament, they call it ice cream. Those of you know, he took away Crimea by force, right? Crimea, he took back. So Crimea in Russian is called cream. So they say Alaska is the next ice cream that he's going to take away. But don't worry, it's not happening. Not only on the Trump, it's not even happening on the Biden. It's all good. So Alaska is here to stay, United States. So this was the purchase of Alaska. And from then on, people migrated to Alaska from the United States and um, the, the Jewish our museum is actually telling the story of the Jewish contribution to Alaska, which is really amazing. I mean, like Anchorage, which is a hundred years old, we just celebrated a hundred years for Anchorage. Anchorage hundred years old. We just had um, we just had Anchorage. We just had uh, the in our museum exhibit. The first mayor of Anchorage was Jewish. The second mayor of Anchorage, he was a Jew from Russia. I mean, the, the biggest library in, in Alaska is called after the second Jewish mayor who actually contributed half of his, of, his, uh, of his wealth for education in Alaska and so on and on. The Jewish contribution is just unbelievable wherever you go. And therefore the museum, what we're doing, the, the reason why we have this Jewish museum is to bring in those Jews who will not go to a synagogue, will not go to a yeshiva for whatever reason, but to a Jewish museum, that's something that talks to them. A museum that has history as they come and, and this, this little Jewish museum, if you ever, I don't know if Montreal has mitzvah things. Do you guys have mitzvah things in Montreal? But in the, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they have seen some mitzvah things in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah there are some, yes, they go around. But to us, our little museum is our little mitzvah thing because we have tourists who come from all over the world. And they, we have a big sign in our, in our in that we have one of our, one of our members of our congregation is in charge on all the advertisement in, the, in the, all the airports in Alaska. So he puts a free, a free advertisement for us about our Jewish museum. So there are tourists who come from Australia, from everywhere in the world, and they have a plan, and they cancel the plan. They say, a Jewish museum? They don't, they don't believe there are human living beside the, they only heard about the, the eagles. So they come rushing you with taxis, and they come into the museum, and that's people who have, have no connection to, to Yiddish guide. Just like the Jews, that's all. They, they love the Jewish people. They feel Jewish, but that's it. As they come in there, we have, a, we have a, actually um, a curator that she moved from Seattle to live here. She's an she's a, she's a artist and she has a experience with museums. So, so she's running the museum and it's right nearby the Chabad, it's across the street, it's, it's the same parking lot. So they ask her, who is behind this museum? She says, oh, it's the Chabad rabbis, we have the Chabad center. They come here, I take them upstairs to the sanctuary, you could see the beautiful mountains and I tell them, don't you want to have a video of yourself putting on film in front of those mountains? And they all melt away, literally. People who never put on film or people who didn't put on film for 50 years and they all do it. So the, this little museum became a little myth to think. So that they, they come and they, so this happens all the time. And, and, and we have, especially the non-Jewish community is really loving this museum. We have every year, once a year, we have a huge gala event one of the biggest in Alaska. And the reason why all the oil companies and all those people are coming to our, to our gala is because they, we have a Jewish museum. They like the idea that we have diversity and tolerance. We have, 
we, ex, you know, we're reaching out to everyone in the community. The Red Zestora Museum, we have another exhibit, for example, about, there's another beautiful story that happened in Alaska, which is related to Israel, you'll never believe it. I'm sure you all know Alaska Airlines. So Alaska Airlines has done an amazing thing and we actually made a big exhibit about it. And this year at our gala, we actually honoring Alaska Airlines. And so Alaska Airlines was there in 1947 when Israel was at 48 when Israel was established and they needed to bring 50,000 refugees from Yemen to Israel. Alaska Airlines was hired to be the, the company to do it because they were not, uh, they didn't have daily flights. They used to have just, uh, they, did, they did just jobs and projects. And in the beginning it was as nice, but then it became dangerous. There were shot arms, they were bombed and so on. And Alaska, there was pressure in Alaska that they should stop it. And this, this, the pilots who did it became so emotionally involved that they decided they'll not stop until they'll bring every child from Yemen to Israel. And they actually changed, they made a fake company and they continued till the end for all, for all year, like 500 flights. Like this. So this is another exhibit that we have in our museum. So the, the relationship between Alaska and the Jewish people was always there. In the beginning it was in Sitka, those of you who have heard of Sitka, this was the this was a, the capital of Russia, of Alaska, when it was under Russia. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Those of you have been, have a chance to go to Alaska. It's a beautiful place, Sitka. And uh, it's still today, even till today, that we have, we have, uh, we have uh, information about Jewish people's davening, praying Friday night um, in, in the Sitka, Alaska in the 1840s. And till today, there are Jews. And actually, we have a very interesting story about um, a young member of our, of our community who became religious and became Hasidic. He is from Philadelphia. I don't know if you heard of him, Rabbi Kosiansky. His name is David Balak. So he's a, a, young, a, young, a young Jew from Philadelphia who was in college in the 19, uh, 1990s and he got involved with, 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 with parties and parties and he's drinking and he got so sick. He went to the doctor, they checked him out. They said, you have no problems. One problem you have, you're partying too much. So he just decided to go away and he moved out of, out of the dormitory and he, and he rented an apartment right near Chabad Center in Philadelphia. And he started to study, to study Tanya or something there for a few months. And then he said, no, he has to go away as far as he can in, in America. He went to Alaska, he went to Sitka. He went to Sitka, he said he had to find the meaning of life. And he comes from a very well-to-do family, a conservative family. And everyone is like, you know, they're the, the Mandel Foundation the big supporters of Gratz College and so on. And he comes to Sitka, Alaska, and he gets involved with a, with a native group. And he's learning their, their philosophies and so on. And there's that day he's finally going to become a sham. It's like he's going to become a leader. And the woman who's going to make him for a leader, she has a dream that night that her mother comes to the dream, which says to her, this person that you're making a leader tomorrow is not one of our tribes. He should go back to his tribes. So she wakes up in the morning, she said to him, are you from, what, what tribe are you from? So he says, I'm from the Jewish people. She said, what, are you coming to us? You guys have the Bible, you have everything. I'm not making you a leader, you go to your people. So he moved to Anchorage and, uh, and uh, he started to come. And actually the Chabad Rabbi in Philadelphia called me when he moved to Alaska. And he said to me, there is this young Jewish kid, put your eye on him. And I said, what do you mean young Jewish kid? He's going to where, to Sitka? From Anchorage to Sitka is flying three hours. What do you mean? Telling me where I'm going to find him in Sitka. So he said, just have the name just in case. A year later, I hear from friends that there is a Jewish boy in town, a lawyer, and his name is David Valen. I said, this name tells me something. I said to one of the ladies who used to go out to Shul, I said, you must bring him here. You must, you must find him, bring him for Shvaiden Adina. He came. Five years later, he went to Yeshiva in Maristan, the famous Yeshiva of Chabad, Tefer Bachorim. And he married a Jewish girl from Chabad in Khan Heights. And now he is a lawyer in Sitka. He's a judge, actually. It's a judge of native, of native law. The, the natives have their own system of judicial system. So he's a judge. And he's like a little Chabad rabbi in Sitka. Sitka has like 30, 40 families. So that's the little story. Wow, wow, wow. How many Jews actually live in Alaska, in Anchorage, or generally in Alaska? <laughs> We have about 3,000 Jews in Anchorage, probably like one block in Montreal. 3,000 Jews in Anchorage and another 3,000 spread all over the state. You will, I, there's not even one, one little village that doesn't have a Jew there, either a teacher or something. There's no place in America where there's no Jews, no place in Alaska. Everywhere there are Jews. 
and the contributions they are making. You know the famous uh, saying about, we just read Parashat Shkalim in the Torah, this, this Shabbos, Parashat Shkalim, where it says that every Jew has to give a half a shekel. So, and, the, and one of the reasons is that you count the Jewish people, how do you count the Jew? You don't count them, you don't count one, two, three, you count the shekels they give. So there's a very famous thing, why do you count Jews by the shekels they give? Because you don't count Jews by, by their quantity, you count them by their contribution, by their quality. The Jewish people are counted by their, by their contribution. And you see wherever you go in the world, could be one Jew in a little village, and he's the teacher, he's the, he's the leader, and so on and on. So the Jewish contribution to the world is just unbelievable. Um, so there, are, there is a lot of work. If all the 3,000 Jews in Lakeridge would come to my shul every Shabbos, I'll be in great shape. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> But I, I, it's not happening. However, Hanukkah, we probably get a third of the Jews. We have a big event at the convention center. We have 700, 800 people. So probably it's a third of the Jewish people in, in Anchorage will come to our Hanukkah. But there is a lot of work with them, believe me. We, my, my daughter is here with, with my son-in-law. We work in the, and this, this Chabad, we have two rabbis here. We have another rabbi in, in Metzl Valley, which is an hour away. And there is place for another 10 rabbis, believe me or not. The al Alavai, we would reach out to every Jew and inspire every Jew. But there is still there is a lot of work to do. Um, just to tell you that how we see the, the Rebbe's vision and how far the Rebbe's vision is. I'll, tell, I'll share with you a story that uh, happened with me uh, two years ago. We came to Alaska. It's amazing that you called me now to speak because we came to Alaska literally before Purim 30 years ago. So not exactly 30 years. And um, when we came to Alaska, the, the community prepared for us a little party in our home. And we came to the house and everyone says, hi, hi, how you doing? There's one person says, Shalom Aleichem. Those of you heard that expression, Shalom Aleichem. Peace to you. That's the Jewish expression of saying hi. And I said, that's the only person says Shalom Aleichem. That's something unusual with him. Anyway, the end of the party, he comes to ask me, are you going to read the Megillah tomorrow? I said, for sure, at my home. He went around the whole party, everyone to tell everybody, the rabbi is going to read the Megillah tomorrow. Nobody came. He was the only one who came. So after the Megillah, I start talking to him. I see, I see something unusual. He tells me a story. He said, listen, he says, I am not Jewish. My wife is Jewish. My child is Jewish. Um, he says he was a he was a sailor. He was a um, he was a sailor in on a, on a boat in Europe. He's from Denmark, and he was sailing around the world. And he saw what the Nazis did to the Jews. And he was so angry of you on Europe that he literally, when he came to New York, he crossed the border. In those those days, it was easy to do. And he just started hanging out with Jews. And he got involved with a Jewish girl who her father was a rabbi. But she, he passed away young, and she was an orphan from the Holocaust also. And he started to hang out with her. And they got married. And they decided the family didn't like it so much, so they decided to go where as far as they came from New York. They came to Alaska. They came to Alaska, they got a baby. A Jewish kid, a Jewish boy, they decided to raise him Jewish. So he decided he was a very honest man. I'm raising him Jewish, I need to be Jewish. And he started to study Judaism. And I came to Anchorage, he was the only person who had the Talmud in English. The Mishnah in English. He had he used to get the Jewish press. He would read it from cover to cover. I mean, it was a, he was also a very smart man, a walking encyclopedia. Really, he knew everything. Now, for 20 years before I came in 1970, I'm just not going back with the story. So he tells me the story. In 1970, the first Chabad rabbis, yeshiva students, as you know, that the Rebbe came to America in 1942. But the Rebbe, when he was still the, the seminal of the previous rabbi, together they established this idea of the roving rabbis where the rabbis go from town to town in the summer. The young yeshiva students, when, when time, when everyone else goes on vacation, the wrong rabbis don't go on vacation. They go from town to town to offer Jewish services to people who don't have, or don't have a little synagogue, or don't, aren't connected and so on, to give them books, to, to study with their children, to make a little camp, whatever it was for three weeks. So the yeshiva students, Two of them, Rabbi Shmuel Spritzer, who lives now in Khan Heights, Rabbi Shmuel Langsam, they were young yeshiva students. In 1968, they asked the Rebbe, can we go to Alaska? And the Rabbi Cholokov said, no. 1969, no. In 1970, Rabbi Cholokov came out and said, Chabad is going to Alaska. The Rebbe gave permission. So they came to Alaska, and he was, can you believe, the first president of the Reformed Temple here in Anchorage was a non-Jew. This man. Nobody else wanted to do it. So he did it. 
His wife is Jewish. She was part of the community. So he was a spy. Now he didn't understand Chabad, not Chabad. But to him, everything was the same. So they came. He opened the shoe, the shoe for them. He did. And they put on film with everybody. They, nobody said anything. Before they left, he sent a letter with them to the Rebbe. And he used to pay, give money to a Kabbalah Center. You'd all, we all heard of the Kabbalah Center in California. And they would print books about Kabbalah. And he would uh, sponsor them. So he read a book, he had a question in Kabbalah. He wrote to the rabbi a question and, and he signed his name. His name was a very clear non-Jewish name. It was Erling Christensen. That's his name. You couldn't get any, right? And the boys used to, they gave the rabbi a report on every, every person that's on Alaska. It was very, the rabbi was very, the rabbi wanted to know, it was the first time Chabad came here, wanted to know what is the situation of the Jewish people, what they do, and how they, how they make a living, and so on and on. And what is their state in Jew, is their Jewish life and everything. So, so, the Rebbe, so the only comment the Rebbe made on the entire trip to Alaska was under this person's name. He wrote, signed his name, only Christian, the Rebbe wrote three words in Hebrew. Aim hu Yehudi, is he Jewish? Question mark. And it was very obvious that the name said Christensen is not Jewish and they wrote on their report is not Jewish. So they asked the Rebbe's personal secretary, he looked at that, looked at the report, he said, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to ask the Rebbe. It is what it is, maybe one day we'll understand. 21 years later, so I come to Alaska and this man tell, telling me, listen, for 20 years I'm begging to convert and no Orthodox rabbi is willing to do it because they all tell me, what, I, mean, I came to Anchorage for two weeks, I'm going to convert someone, it's not happening. So he said, I went to the reform rabbi and he gave me conversion. However, at the time the reform rabbi did not include the conversion of circumcision. But he studied the Bible. He knew that Abraham circumcised himself. He said to himself, it can't be a conversion without a circumcision. But he went to the hospital and asked for a surgery and gave him a circumcision. But he always knew he's not converted orthodoxy. So when I came, he said to me, now you, have, now you are a permanent rabbi here. That's it. The excuses are over. You will convert me. And I'm just 26 years old. A little picture. I just came to, uh, I just started my shlechat. I'm not going to convert anybody. It's not happening. So every week I'm giving him another excuse. He comes every Shabbos to show, he says, Rabbi, and he became also a big supporter. He, he, he asked me, I was, I mean, I came, you know, I, I was like one of those rabbis. I came with a few hundred dollars to Anchorage. There was someone who was supposed to give us whatever. A story happened, a rabbi came from Seattle, he needed dinner, and the, the person promised him dinner. She was, she was pregnant. One of, our, one of our members said she was pregnant and she had to go to the hospital. So they, they said, Rabbi, heaven for dinner. We had no money, tell us. Anyway, we, we called my brother to send me to send me by FedEx some money, by another FedEx, by, uh, what is it called? By the, it used Transfer. to be the, whatever. Anyway, the bottom line, he West walks in the house and says, what's going on here? He said, whatever, we, we are busy with dinner. So he said, do you have a bank account? We said, no, he said, he took me to like, Took it in the bank, he opened the account, he put the money, he was he became one of well, anyway. The bottom line was I told him every every week another excuse. Finally, I tell him, listen, I only do Chabad conversion. So what is Chabad conversion? I said, you know, with a hat, I thought that this will this will uh, push him away with a hat and the kapat. He said, I'll do that. Next week I say, we only do it in New York. So I'll, I'll take the family in New York. I just came. It was two months. Ago. I, anyway, I had no I didn't know what to do. I called New York, they said, listen. If he wants us strongly, just bring him. We'll do it in New York. So I brought him to New York and I came to the Rebbe. When the Rebbe saw him, so, so this rabbi who was here, Rabbi Spritzer, who was here 21 years before, he saw me as I walked to 770 and he said, this is him, this is him. I said, what? He took me aside, he said, the Rebbe wrote about him, is he Jewish? And now he's coming to New York to convert. Anyway, so you see what the, when the Rebbe writes three words, nobody understands what it means, but there is a far vision here the same vision that the Rebbe had when the Rebbe came to America. He started with the, with the programs in New York, in Brooklyn. He started with the program for Shabbat, the Mesivot Shabbat, which was the, the boys used to go from, from the from 770, used to go to the synagogues and collect children from the streets. Because a lot of Jews used to live in Crown Heights and, start, and do, give them candies and do some, some verses of the Torah. And the Rebbe said, we started with the Shabbat programs and from that we will spread to all over the world. And the Rebbe said in 1942, it looked like such a dream, like, I mean, like saying today that Moshiach is coming within two seconds. 
that's how it looked like. The Rebbe said we had there were 20 yeshiva boys in 770 who went to do parties for Shabbat parties from dead will spread all over the world. But the Rebbe had the vision that we will spread all over the world. Same thing about this individual. The Rebbe saw that he will become Jewish and he will become a supporter and everything. And that's exactly what happened. So when the Rebbe saw him, the Rebbe told him like this. Alaska gives a cold attention, what I told you before. But in order to live in Alaska, you have to stop the temperature. But the Rebbe told him, when it comes to spreading Yiddish card, you should do it with excitement. It was actually to him. And then the last time we saw the Rebbe, which was, which was um, around this time, it was uh, like literally two days before Rosh Chodesh Adar, before we went, we, 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 there was a, every year there's a convention of the, of the Chabad women emissaries. And the convention is always at the Rebbe, since the Rebbe's wife's Yotzai, which is the end, the end of the month of Shvat, which is right before Purim. And we were there, we went back there, and uh, the Rebbe saw us, and the Rebbe, um, we saw the Rebbe is not feeling good, so we made up that we will go fast, because Rebbe used to always stop us and go longer with us, so we, we went really fast, and my cousin was there, Rabbi Jacobson and his wife, and they had a baby who had, who had a, the option is at the haircut party, the Rebbe started to give him a dollar, and the Rebbe stopped, and he called us back, and again, his face sh really lit literally lit up and shine with a, with a smile. He called in Yiddish, he said, he's not machen, and he became back, running back, and he says, machen dort we should make it warm there. And that was, the, that was the Rebbe's mission, that we should make warm not only in Alaska, but all over the world, as there was once a guy who ran for, for Congress here against our congressman. As those of you heard, we have a congressman who is already for 40 years, congressman uh, Young. So there was a guy, he's a Republican, there was a guy, Democrat, who was trying to run against him, so he had no chance, he went to the Rebbe. And uh, it was like also 1990. So he said, so the guy who brought him said to the Rebbe that he's trying to run for Congress in, for Congress in Alaska. So the Rebbe said, Alaska is in the north. But from the north, you have to affect the entire United States. So, so we know we have the mission that we have to, from the north, we have to affect the United States as, as our oil is affecting the United States. So that's, that's our story. And that, what is, you know, there is a letter from the Rebbe about oil that oil is something that whether you find the oil where it's dark and cold. And when you dig all the way when it's dark and cold and you don't, you're not afraid of the darkness and the coldness, then you take out the oil which makes warm and light. So this, that's our mission as Jews to, to bring light. And even though we all, we all going through such a crazy time with the Zoom and everything, but look at that because of the Zoom, we have an opportunity to bring together Jews from all over the world and celebrate Purim in a, in a much deeper way so bring Yiddishkeit in our homes. You know, a lot of people got used to in America and in Canada that Yiddishkeit is only the synagogue. But when it comes to home, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew in the synagogue, but at home, now because of Zoom, we have to be Yiddishkeit in our home. So there is a reason, there is a reason for everything. And with the, with the, with the, with the, with the Rebbe's blessing, with God's help, we will all live through this, this, this terrible Corona and will come out stronger, more refined, and the world will be more refined, will be more ready for the real new world. Amen, amen. I, you know, it's, uh, what's interesting is, you're talking about the, the warmth and bringing the warmth, the fact that you're able to bring up your children and two of them, you said, uh, who are married, I don't know if you have more married yet, who are not only married, but they came back to join uh, with you and your wife in, in, in your work to, to warm up Alaska, one with you and one even to a new frontier. This is, uh, this is incredible. You know, some people think, how do you bring up children in a place where there's no real education? They're not surrounded with all of the trappings of, uh, you know, religious or Hasidic or or a Crown Heights type of situation. Maybe what we have in Montreal, and yet they're they're full of that warmth to come back and bring more warmth to the north. What's the yeah. secret? What's the secret? The secret is very simple. Um, you know the very famous story about there was a Hasidic, Hasidic sage, his name was Reb Meir of Primishan, a Hasidic Rebbe, in the, about 200 years ago. So there was a, in the little town of Primishan, there was a mikveh, where the mikveh was built at the, at the top of a, of a mountain, of a, of a big hill. It was in the winter, and it was very icy. We know icy from Montreal, we know icy from Alaska, but it's very icy, it's very dangerous. I once walked Shabbos to Shul, and I literally fell on the ice and I broke my back for three months. I was literally paralyzed. And then I started to wear clits to show because uh, it's, it could be even icy, it's icy. So this Hasidic Rebbe, 
when it came to winter and it was very snow and it was very slippery, everybody would go around the mountain to go to the mikveh. And he used to go up the mountain and never fell. And there were some two people who were, uh, you know, they were like very open-minded. The old town spoke about this minute. Nah, can't be. Probably the rabbi is just a little bit, he, he does it better from everyone else. So they walked behind him and they all fell. They almost broke their, their legs and everything. So finally they came into him and they said, Remember, they said, tell us the secret. What's your secret? Why are you not falling? Everyone is falling. And he said, in Yiddish, he said, I mean, when you're connected up there, you don't fall down. So if you're asking the secret, the secret is if we are connected to the Rebbe, if we are connected to our souls, we're connected to Hashem, our children feel that and they can continue in our ways. And there is no other secret. We don't have to tell them anything. Just now, a uh, famous Chabad rabbi passed away at the age of 88, Rabbi Gerelik. He was my brother's father-in-law, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Gershon Mendel Gerelik. And he was the kind of guy, when he was coming to Hasidic gatherings, he never demanded, he never preached to anyone. He just spoke about what he feels. He didn't, he didn't do any preaching. And all the yeshiva students were, were all drawn to his forbringings because he didn't preach to anyone. He just enjoyed who he is. And that's what everyone wants to see. And want to feel his feelings. And that's the ultimate secret for education. Why will your children continue in your ways if they see that you love it? Because what you, what, if you truly love something and it comes across that you love it, they will see and they will do it. Why wouldn't they do something you love? If you love chocolate, they also want chocolate. I don't know if it's so healthy or not, but whatever you love, they will also adapt to it. So that's what you have, you have to really be there. And if you connect it, they'll go on. That, that is uh, that is beautifully said and is definitely very, very true. I want to ask you something before we open up. Maybe some people have questions. A lot of people travel to Alaska. A lot of people I know take uh, take um, cruises. They use the pass through Alaska. A lot of people come to Alaska. Uh, when someone's going to Alaska, how do they find yourself? If they're going to be there spending a Shabbos or to get kosher food or to, just to see the museum, the Chabad house, how would they find you? We have a website, alaskajewishcampus.org, and in that website, you have several sites. One goes to the museum, one goes to the preschool, one goes to, to the Lubavitch Jewish Center. So you'll find them, you'll go to the Lubavitch Jewish Center, you'll find us, or you call us. Uh, there are not too many rabbis running around in Anchorage, so you'll find us. Wherever you go, you ask for the rabbis, you'll go along, give you the address. And uh, yeah, and we, have a, we actually have a, a special uh, package for tourists with all the questions, with all the information. We are lucky to be in Midtown Anchorage where there are at least six hotels right nearby the shul. One hotel is literally a door away from the synagogue, a beautiful hotel. So we have a lot of groups that come from Israel, from all over who come here to stay for Shabbos and they enjoy it. And unfortunately with Corona, as we all know, it's a little harder with uh, making big meals, but we do you know, Shabbos to go and so on. So wherever you come to Alaska, the, the museum is still open. You make a, the, the museum credit will drive you crazy. She'll, she'll ask you all the questions, COVID questions, but eventually she'll let you in. If you, if you get in trouble with her, I'm here to help. I have, I have connections, so I'll let you in. And everything should, uh, we, we should be able to find us. We would love to, if you tell us you come from the Chabadas of Rabbi Kosansky in the Rebetzin, you'll get a red carpet, we'll treat you like, like the most important people in the world, and we treat everybody like that. But of course, uh, when you tell you mentioned because the asking name, the doors are open, and we would love to see you. Hopefully, this summer. I know Canada is giving trouble to Alaska. I don't know if you know with the cruises, and Alaska said the, the cruise line said they'll still do it, and there's a whole thing. Canada doesn't let, and Alaska wants the tourists. I don't know if I want. I want. I want to everyone should be healthy and happy. But with the vaccine, if you're vaccinated, for sure you should be able to come. And so on. So, you know, that's the whole story. We all talk about the vaccine, like you do in your home. We talk about that. We all talk about it. But one thing we know for sure, that the scientists believe in the Torah. Why do we know they believe in the Torah? Because which scientist in his right mind will spend 40 years to find a vaccine if he doesn't believe in the Talmud? The Talmud says, Akodesh Borchum Magdim Refur Lamaka. The Almighty God brings the medicine before he brings the disease. So when a scientist who sees that there is a disease which is called corona, he already knows that there must be a medicine because the Almighty God said there will be a medicine before the disease. Therefore, it's worth it for him to spend billions of dollars 
to find it. And as we see, the miracle happened again, and there is a vaccine. And, it's, and now from Israel, the studies are coming that this vaccine is, is 95% helping not only not to be sick, but even not to be infected and so on and on. So it's really a great miracle. And who is the president of Pfizer? As you all know, a Jewish doctor. Holocaust the, survivor, son of what? Holocaust survivor. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jewish, right? A Jewish doctor. From Greece originally, from Greece originally, the son of Holocaust, Holocaust survivor. And, and, and who is the chief doctor in Moderna? In, in Moderna? Israeli doctor, Dr. Katz. So yeah. you could see again the Jewish contribution to the world, and so we should be proud who we are, and and not not to be proud in a way that we are better, not that we are better, that we are there dedicated to serve others. We are servants, not 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 uh, it's not leadership, but servant. We are servants of the world. So it's a pleasure. Well, hi everybody, and a happy Purim. It's a pleasure, and, and, and I'm lucky to have such a rabbi and a Rebetzin who are taking care of you in such a beautiful community, so I'm very honored to be part of you, and l'chaim, l'chaim, and whenever you come to Alaska, please call me, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You definitely warmed uh, up Montreal a lot. Like the Rebbe said, from the north, you'll warm up, and, and I don't know if you want to feel the question, a quick question or two in case we have. And any, if anyone has, I mean, you were so articulate and so uh, warming and so... You, you, you make Alaska everyone jealous. They want to come and feel uh, feel what it is like in Alaska with you and your wife are doing incredible work. But if anyone has a, a question they want to ask, we'll take a, you know one or two questions. Just sure, raise I'm your sure. hands and unmute yourself. Okay. Do we, do we have here? I see you see you did such a, a good job that I see everyone is. Uh, we had yeah. someone here who has a cousin who who is in Alaska. Ellie. Wait, unmute thank you. yourself. Really? Ellie. No, she was in Alaska. Oh, she was. Okay. She was touring here or she lived in Alaska? She lived a few a few years in Alaska, yes. She's a, she's a daughter of my cousin. And she was in Anchorage or in a different city? To be honest with you, I don't know. Okay. I know she was in Alaska. I know she she met she met her husband there and uh, they got married in Israel. What was her name? Do you remember? No, his name I don't remember. What's her uh, name? What's her her name? name is Cohen. Cohen is a very general name. It's a bunch yeah. of yeah. <laughs> and a Cohen, a doctor, also still very general. Very nice. I'm sure. Very beautiful. Yeah. You see, so uh, some connection. You beautiful. Get Pleasure. Beautiful. Someone was curious that this story you said about Christensen, when he became a Jew, did he change his name also? Or he kept that name. <laughs> I have to say, he actually, I, when I left to Anchorage, he was another week in New York. So he went again to the rabbi on a Sunday and he asked the rabbi, My name is Christian, should I change my name? And the rabbi says, Certainly. And, <laughs> and he changed it to, to Yisrael ben Avraham. Yisrael like, ben Avraham. <laughs> The father of Moses, Yisro Jethro Ben Avraham. It was his last name. Wow. wow, wow. The, first, the first convert. Yep. And, and so now you have a school. Someone's asking, you have a, a preschool right. uh, in Alaska. I, I guess there is a, that's the only Jewish school is for, for preschool? Or? We, also have, we also have an after school program where kids come every day to study after, I, after the public school. And we have three Lubavitch girls who come here every year, um, high school graduates who are, who are volunteering here every year for, for the year to teach in our school and our after school program and so on and on. So that's what we have. And the, the preschool is has like 40 children and it's uh, one of the best uh, educational preschools in Anchorage. And actually we have a very strong mitigation plan for Corona and believe it or not, a lot of Jewish families have moved to us just because of mitigation plan. Because <laughs> we're not so careful, and they moved here because we were careful. So yes, I know there are those who don't like all the rules of Corona, but there are those who really like it. So pick and choice. But yes, yeah, so we have a school, and we have this after-school program, and of course we have the adults' education and the synagogue and everything that comes with that, and all the programs and so on. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, you're welcome to come. And I see somebody, well. but I don't think she could. Very well. So thank you again very, very thank much. You. And we wish you, in the name of everyone, lots of the continued hatslacha, 
And uh, we were talking before at the beginning, before you came on, that this is this week is Vasily Bigdash. At every place we go, we make a uh, dira a dwelling place for Hashem. We should take them all together to Yerushalayim with Mashiach very quickly and uh, celebrate Purim all together. It, you know, Yerushalayim, all the not stuff was spread out anymore, but all together as one. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. It's a pleasure and a, and a real, a real schus, a real honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. your time and all the best. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone for, for coming and joining and the really feeling uh, the warmth of Judaism coming from Alaska, bubbling over. Uh, this is uh, this is where we know that the, you know the Jewish people. It's not the place. The environment, we create the environment. The environment doesn't yeah. make it a good setting for us to behave Jewish. We're the ones, like you said, are the leaders, the one who make the environment. And this is this is why we're so blessed. So um, thank you for joining. Thank you. And look out for the information for next week's Love one. And really all the best to to every everyone. And have a great uh, rest of the week and a good Shabbos. And thank you all. Thank you. What's next week? No, What's next week? We're, we're finalizing. We're, we're, we're finalizing. The next day we'll, we'll be 100% sure. Beautiful. Great. Because it's right before Purim, so a lot of people are very busy. So a lot of the rabbis, so we're going to figure out which one we're going to do. So good to see everyone. And yes. I hope you felt uh, enlightened and, uh, you know, felt. I think the word felt is very good. You felt the... the the dynamic, the warmth, the excitement, mm -hmm. and incredible work that they're doing. Where uh, you know, we're not only a place for Jewish people, but it's a beacon of light with entire Alaska and the pride of uh, of, of the Jews in Alaska. So, yeah. this is great, great. Thank you. So, with this, we sign off and wish everyone a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.